to today's Google Webmaster Central Office Hours Hangouts. Uh, my name is John Mueller. I'm a Webmaster Trends Analyst here at Google in Switzerland. And part of what I do is talk with webmasters and publishers uh, like the ones here in the Hangout, uh, the ones that submitted lots of questions, and uh, try to help answer anything that's, that's still kind of open. Um, as always, uh, if there are any new people here in the Hangout that have any questions that have been on their mind for a while, uh, feel free to jump on in and ask them now. Uh, John, I have two questions, and then maybe I will leave uh, the Hangout and watch the live stream to leave other people to join. Uh, basically, there are like two short questions, and then I will let you be with uh, the Q&A, because I saw that there are plenty of those. Um, my first question would be, uh, how important are the errors in uh, Webmaster Tools for href lang return no tag? So basically, I have the href pointing to uh, a different language, but there is no uh, return back on, on that one. Is it because it's a redirect or it's a mismatch? Would that cause any problems, or it's something that we can slide? So what would happen there is we would ignore that set of href lang links. So if one page links to the other one, and the other one doesn't confirm that link, then we assume that link isn't correct, and we ignore it. So it's On both of, ways. Yeah, those it didn't really need to be confirmed from both sides. Okay. And uh, one other question, somehow related with this one, uh, there is a lot of talk online from SEOs and also your colleagues. Uh, is it still OK to put rel canonical on every single page uh, sure. pointing to itself? Just in order to avoid like duplicate parameters and things like that, is it? Yeah. The, yeah. Sure. So pointing to itself, that's okay. Site-wide, one million pages, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how many pages. Um, you just need to make sure that it points to the clean URL version, that you're not like pointing to the parameter version accidentally, or that you're not always pointing to the home page accidentally, because those are the kind of mistakes that we try to catch. But, and that uh, also includes like having dub 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 in front or end slash, so like really the canonical version that you see yeah. up there in the other sure. Do that. sure, you can do that across millions of pages. Uh, we'll try to take that into account. Perfect. Last one and really short uh, this time. Uh, the document that was released like some days ago with all the the, the raters and all the information. At some point there was a discussion that. Um, there might be some issues with uh, having affiliate links, but it's, it's an older problem anyway. So the question is, is there a problem if the affiliate links within content, so in, in, in body, are somehow hidden with bit.ly or any URL short, uh, like having the, the URL short? Uh, can that be seen as a sneaky redirect somehow? I mean, that's done from like tracking perspective, not to, to hide the affiliate. I mean, Google anyway sees it at the end of the day. but. Uh, do you think that it's, it's possible that those type of fleet, especially if it's like in large numbers, uh, can be seen as somehow grayish or like sneaky redirect I, somehow? I wouldn't worry about it in a case like that. I think there are, are definitely better ways to track clicks on a page. So that's something that within analytics, you, you have ways of doing that uh, so that you kind of save that extra redirect through the external site. So okay. I try to just uh, set up the links directly and track them in a different way. But if this is the only way you can do tracking and you kind of need that tracking for other reasons, then it's it's not going to be a big problem. So, so you think Google won't see those as, uh, I don't know, a mean to deceive someone, either the users or, or no. Google by any way? No. I mean, that's like a common common setup for affiliate programs anyway. So it's not it's not completely unseen. Um, I, I just really try to make sure that the links go directly so that uh, they're a bit faster for the users. And there are definitely better ways to track these things. But uh, if that's the way you have your site set up, I think that's fine. It's not going to change Perfect. anything to like point directly instead of pointing to a, a redirecting URL. Perfect. Uh, thanks a lot. Thanks for the invite. I will jump out, so I'll leave room for someone else. And uh, I will just watch right. the Thanks a lot. Thanks for dropping by. All right. Uh, any more questions from someone who's kind of new to the Hangouts here? Um, I am. Um, hi, John. Hi, everyone. Hi. Um, 
the question I have is, I have a friend of mine has this forum for the past, I think, 10 years or so. And, well, you know, it's a forum. People ask stupid questions. People answer stupid things. And since 2012 or something, I his traffic like dropped like heavily, and I think it's something related to Panda because of that l tons of low quality content he has. Um, the question is not if it's Panda or not. The question is just how can a webmaster like him, who he doesn't know much about SEO or content or whatever, be responsible for that? He also has some linking problems because it's so you know PHP BB and stuff, but that's another issue. <laughs> yeah. So I I guess the the overarching kind of theme there is as a webmaster you're you're responsible for your website and how it's presented to other users and to the search engines. So if you have a forum and you have a lot of um, let's say uh, low quality user generated content within the forum, then that's something that we see as part of your content. So it's not that we would say, well, this is a forum, this content was generated by someone else, we'll ignore it more or less. Um, but essentially, that's a part of the content. So it's kind of like a webmaster of any other kind of website, you have to work on making sure that the content that you provide is really useful, compelling, high quality, unique uh, for the users. And obviously, with a really large forum, that's that's not something that's easily done. That takes a lot of time, either doing it manually or working with a team of uh, kind of admins or moderators within the forum, or setting up some kind of automated system to kind of figure out which of the content is really great and which of the content is kind of well more, more like filler material or maybe just chatter among friends, those kind of things. So. I, I don't yeah. think there is just like one solution that works everywhere. What I would recommend him is to remove the chatter forums, the chatter groups, the low quality content to be indexed by it. it doesn't matter to be indexed like that, just the the, the good quality stuff, right? Yeah, I I think that's definitely an option. Some forums uh, just put that content behind like a login. So if you're logged in and you're a regular user and you find all of this content, it's not that it's removed, but it's just not like a, a part that's front and center when a random user comes to visit the site. All right, awesome. Thanks, John. Sure. Hi, John. Hi. Hi, this is Mario. Um, uh, I would like to make you uh, two questions, sorry for my English. Um, one is about uh, structured data. Uh, we, we think we did all, almost uh, everything in the Webmaster Tool Search Console, uh, but we don't know when, um, uh, how to recognize it if, uh, if we are indexed uh, properly. How can we? So with regards to structured data, if it's indexed properly, I guess the, the main place to look is a structured data dashboard within Search Console that tells you which of the types of structured data we found on the website um, we were able to pick up, which ones we were not able to pick up. That's one thing. Um, the other one is the index status information in Search Console, which tells you how many of your pages in general have been indexed. Uh, already did. Uh, there is uh, the magic number uh, <laughs> with the plus uh, nearby. Uh, but I'm, I really mean in uh, inside the, the the search engine. How can we recognize? We have you know uh, uh, breadcrumbs and uh, stars. Uh, okay, rating. Uh, but we don't see on in the search results how. Why? Sorry. Maybe. Okay. So to see if they're visible, you can just search like a normal user would do. But yeah. if they're not shown in the search results, then we, we kind of have three main main items that are responsible there to where we have to figure out if 
if a page should be showing which snippets or not. Uh, the first one is if they're technically implemented properly, which you can test with this testing tool. Uh, you're nodding, so you probably have seen that before. Uh, the other one is if they're implemented correctly from a policy point of view. So you're using recipe markup on recipe pages. You're using breadcrumb markup for the breadcrumb. Articles. Not, yeah. I mean, yeah. Th those are the kind of things where if you use the right type of markup, that's already uh, important. Uh, whereas if you use like recipe markup on a product review page, then that doesn't fit. That's something we might throw out. Uh, and the third one, which is the trickiest one, I think, is that we have to recognize that your website is of high enough quality that we really trust this markup and want to show it in the search results. And that's something where there is not a simple test where you can say, oh, it reached like this high quality. Um, where it's, it's really hard to tell. So one thing I think you can do is do a site colon query for your website for do some what? of the pay, a, a site colon. So uh, in the search box in Google, you can enter site uh, colon, yeah. and then your domain name, and then maybe some of the keywords there. Yeah, they did. And if in the site query we show the structured markup, the rich snippets, then from a technical point of view, we have it right. From a kind of policy point of view, we, we accepted those. And if they're not shown in a normal search, then that means from a quality point of view, we're not really sure how, how we should treat this website. Um, despite the fact that uh, I did all or everything, but not, I, I don't know, the high quality. And you, you know, you think you make, can make the best content, but maybe it's not enough for uh, Google. How can I, I? How can I know this? Um, it's really hard to tell. Yeah, I I don't think there's a simple solution there. So what what I would do is post in one of the webmaster forums and get like honest feedback from other webmasters, and see if there's something from a quality point of view that maybe you're missing. Uh, that you're kind of glancing over because this is your baby and your website is always the best. Yeah. <laughs> it, I, I, I know how it is. So, uh -huh. uh, but sure. kind of the, the hard feedback from other peers, the, the things that you might kind of know in the back of your head, but you don't want to uh, kind of see see directly. But so that's the asking kind of feedback. In, yeah. Yeah. Asking into the, for, in the webmaster forum, right? Yeah. Thanks. The second question is about um, Google News. I'm, I'm not, I don't know if you can answer to this. Maybe, maybe not. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, uh, another side. Um, uh, from one day to another, uh, a long time ago, I would say three years ago. Um, before that day, it was it reached the first position mm, normally. Uh, usually, uh, from that day, uh, whatever we we were going to write, whatever uh, whatever we were going to 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 post, uh, we have never ever reached the first position. Um, I think that it would be one penalty, and this is the, my first time that I have the, the possibility to to ask to you to to someone to Google. Is there any something that where I can ask uh, if there is any penalty or whatever? Um, if there is a manual action, you should see that in Search Console. There isn't. There isn't one there. Then that's essentially the, the algorithms that are trying to do something there. But what you can do as a Google News publisher is contact the Google News team. Uh, in the Help Center, they have a contact link, and you can send them, I think, an email and ask them the question directly. I don't know if they can help with a ranking question like that. Yeah. Maybe there's a technical problem. Maybe there's something that doesn't show as an error in the tools, but technically makes it hard for us to rank. So I, I would just ask them and see mm -hmm. if, if you can get some help there. OK, thanks a lot. Bye to everybody. I leave. Sure. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks. All right. Um, let me run through some of the questions that I picked out uh, from today. And uh, then we should potentially have time to go through more and more of your questions 
uh, here as well. Um, let me just try to find the right questions here. Um, Google Search Console Fetch and Render, we added a map where we are located to try to improve our SEO, but Googlebot has it blocked. And it's a high severity. So what should we do? Uh, so essentially, what sometimes happens, depending on the way that you embed a map, is that the map itself is blocked by robots text, maybe on the Google Map side, maybe on whatever other map provider side that you're using. And if we can't see that map, then we can't kind of index that content from that map. But if you have your address on the HTML on the, of this page, uh, if you have a link to Google Maps or whatever on those pages, then we can pick that up and use that and understand your location better. Uh, the tricky part is if there's something within the map that is only visible within the map that can't be found on the HTML directly, then that's something we wouldn't be able to pick up if the map is blocked by robots. So if you have something like a pop-up bubble with the opening hours or your phone numbers in it, then I would just copy that content to within your HTML as well so that it's visible directly on the page. And then we can pick that content up there. And for the users, the map is obviously a nice touch that gives them directions, all of that. Um, let's see. There's uh, kind of the indexing uh, question. Um, uh, Google search isn't indexing my site. There are no content keywords. It doesn't provide structured data. Um, most pages appear if you do a site query. So I double-checked the site. And what I noticed in the URL is that you have an umlaut in there. Um, which means that uh, it's, it's essentially a special character. And what we often find is that people who have kind of these special characters in their domain names, they sometimes have an alternate version of their site as well. So in this case, with an O with an umlaut, can be written as OE. And uh, I notice that some of your content is indexed with the OE version and some with the umlaut version. So what I would do there is pick one of these versions and really make sure that it's the canonical version for your site, uh, that you have a rel canonical setup, a redirect setup to that version, and also double check that that's the version that you look at in Search Console. So it's probably not that we're not indexing anything. It's just that we're not looking at the variation that you have currently opened in Search Console. All right, uh, another bunch of site structure questions. Try to find them. Uh, is there an optimum way of setting up a blog section on your website so it improves the overall quality, or is it just a simple case of linking to the content uh, within a relevant product uh, or section page? So essentially, you can set that up however you want. It's not from our point of view that we say a blog is completely different content and needs to be handled in a special way. It's essentially content that you have on your site. Um, maybe these are articles. If you call it a blog or if you call it an article collection or product reviews or whatever you want to call it, is essentially doesn't really matter for us. Uh, content is content. So if you link to it, we'll try to pick that up and crawl and index it. Um, larger sites with unique URLs, uh, with over 50,000 unique URLs, and a better folder structure, taxonomy, will that help Googlebot to crawl and index the page or the site more efficiently and faster on a regular basis? Uh, so we essentially don't look at the taxonomy of a URL uh, when we crawl content. We essentially just look to see if this is a unique URL and if we think that it leads to unique content. So if you have a website set up in a way that has minimum duplicate content that we don't get sent off into URL sections of a site that are completely irrelevant or that are duplicates, then essentially we can crawl and index that content fairly efficiently. So you don't need to put text into the URLs or make it uh, have a semantic structure within the URLs itself. Um, there's a similar question. Could it hurt our rankings if we have missing levels in the URL structure of our site? Uh, for example, we have slash clothing, slash shirts, and then slash color, slash blue, but no 
single slash color over there. Uh, from our point of view, that doesn't matter. Again, we don't try to semantically take apart the URL itself for crawling, for indexing. We essentially try to see which URL is pointed at and crawl and index that URL as efficiently as we can. It doesn't really matter if there are like, parts of the site that are missing. Sometimes you'll see users try to edit the URL, but I think that's fairly rare. And mostly, I guess, more advanced users that would be doing that. Um, let's see where the other one is. Uh, is it possible that my internal pages are more authoritative than my home page? Uh, so with PageRank gone, domain authority, uh, I guess they check various tools. Um, from our point of view, sure. Uh, other pages of your site can be more authoritative than your home page. Uh, sometimes we'll see that a specific product is really, really popular from a website, and everyone goes to that product page and don't really go to the home page. And that's completely fine. That's essentially up to you, uh, essentially up to how you organize your business, how you organize your website. It's not something where we would say this is a bad sign if everyone loves your products, but nobody likes your home page. Um, There's another one, kind of, towards authority. Uh, what can we do to make our to what can we do to our content to make Google believe that we are an authority on the subject? Uh, should we, for instance, be including links in our content to places that have sourced information? Is that going to have a positive SEO effect? So I guess first of all, I would take a step back and say if you want to be an authority for your uh, for a specific topic, you should be an authority for that topic for your users, not for Google. Um, because essentially, we try to see what, what comes out in the end, how users react to this, how they link to this content, how they, kind of they, they recommend it to other people. That's the kind of stuff we try to pick up. And that's the kind of stuff that you can influence by really being an authority, rather than by trying to fake being an authority uh, through kind of links on a page, those kind of things. So specifically with regards to links on a page, one really old school spam topic is uh, that people put Wikipedia links on their pages. And they assume that Google will look at this and say, oh, this person must be really fantastic because look at all of these Wikipedia links on there. And that's not really how our algorithms work. So just by placing links on a page doesn't necessarily make it a high quality page, high quality content. You really should aim to actually be high, or have high quality content and really be an authority in that area, not just uh, show that for Google. Can I tra uh, transi transition into a press release with this question? Or try it. Try it. Sure. Well, I just wanted to know that if it's a high quality uh, press release, and I mean content-wise, like seven pages, for instance, seven pages. Um, and I know that's a long uh, press release, but uh, if it's a no-follow, it's fine, right? If it goes to a no-follow to the site, uh, okay. That, that's okay, right? So you have no issues whatsoever as long as the press release is a no-follow, and you can go nuts uh, if it's really a serious brand, you know, and they're releasing shoes and every single month and well, I'm just, yeah. Yeah. So from, from our point of view, the, the part about passing page rank is definitely something that uh, we, we look at or that we try to recognize. If it's like trying to gain page rank through press releases, that's definitely a problem. So if you have the nofollow there, I don't see a problem with that. Uh, with regards to the, the content itself, that's essentially up to you and what you're trying to achieve there. And for some businesses, it makes sense to do press releases, because that's how they kind of reach out to the people that are talking about this topic, that are writing yeah, about this well, topic. to the shareholders. Yeah, I mean, for, for other businesses, it might not make that much sense. Or if you're just like an online uh, shop and nobody really reads or uses your press releases, then that's probably time that you could be spending somewhere else. But uh, for some businesses, it definitely makes sense. The Google search reviewers, uh, it'll take them a while to come to this page, but uh, when they rate it, well, I mean, once they rate it, that 
press release can also become authoritative later on, no? If it's well, well the, the search quality raters are more to kind of help guide the, the way that we build the algorithms. So they're not going to crawl the whole web and say, oh, this is a good page, this is a bad page, but rather the algorithm is doing the right thing for this query by showing this set of pages. So that's essentially just content on other people's sites, on these press release sites that uh, we try to pick up an index. OK. Thanks. Um, I've got a syndicate question, if that's OK, John. Sure. Um, on a site with half a million pieces of content, um, would a ratio of eight syndicated articles, high quality syndicated articles, let me stress high quality, um, to every original piece of content, would that be viewed negatively by Panda? So eight syndicated articles to one original article, something yeah, like that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of things that happen um, that are worth sharing with everybody. I don't know. It's, it's really hard to say, because uh, these quality algorithms look at the site overall. Yeah. And uh, that's something where syndicated content isn't, per se, like low quality and bad. But uh, it does need to provide some value for users. So if people come there and they say, oh, I've seen this article five times already today, then I don't know if that's, that's really like the best kind of content to put on a site. And like front and center, but uh, I don't think there's any like static threshold between like this is the amount of copies you can have on your site, and this is the amount of unique own your content that you have to have on a site. It's really that our algorithms try to look at the site overall and determine mm -hmm. how it should be handled from a quality point of view. Yeah, when you get to big figures of pages, when there's a lot of pages, like a million pages, it's just difficult to keep the original stuff to the levels of uh, you know, this, the syndicated stuff that may be great news, like entertainment news, like Bono falls off stage and breaks his leg, um, which may have happened 10 minutes ago and it comes through on a feed. That might be great information, and the people that are visiting the site may not know this. Um, but it's just difficult to keep the levels of the original stuff up. And do we need to rewrite Bono falls off stage and breaks his leg? Does that need to be written a million times? You know, we, we, to the user, the value. Oops, don't hear you anymore. But, but that, John, that that's essentially how press or press releases work, isn't it? One company, let's say Apple's launching a, a new iPhone, they issue a press release, and then a million sites tank that and rewrite it. That that's surely the yeah the ones that republish it. They they're all citing the original source in one way or another. So yes, surely you should rewrite it. I, but do it sure, in a way you know, that's compatible with your site. Yeah, I, I think that's something you probably need to test with your own users and to see how they respond to this kind of content. Um, I imagine for some things it makes sense to get more in-depth information uh, out there in an article where you're not just like tweaking the words to make it look unique, but actually providing some value of your own. And in other cases, Maybe like uh, the syndicated content directly also makes sense, but I I think that's something you probably can easily test, or easily, or, or easier than at least like seeing what Google does with it. Uh, test it by uh, double checking how your users are responding to that. Do do A/B testing. Um, take the different types of content that you have and see how users actually respond to that kind of content. Uh, let me move on with the next bunch of questions here, just so that we can kind of run through these, and then we'll hopefully still have time for more live questions along the way. Um, our business has individual branch pages for our depots, but in order for our services to rank for each branch, do we need an internal link between the branch and the service pages, or is Google clever enough to figure that out? So in general, we do crawl a website by looking through links. So if within your website we don't have links between the individual pages, then it's really hard for us to crawl those pages to understand the context of the individual pages there. So I definitely make sure that it's kind of crawlable internally. 
that we can go from one page to the other pages within a website. I think in this specific situation, when you're talking about individual branch pages, you kind of need to watch out that you don't head into uh, the doorway page situation where that you create maybe individual pages for all of the services for each of the locations, and suddenly you have thousands of cities that each have five or 10 or 20 different pages that are essentially all the same, then that looks really kind of low quality, kind of doorway pagey, almost spammy type content. So that's kind of what I'd watch out for there. Uh, it's not so much the internal links between these pages, but really kind of the, the general structure of what you're trying to put out there. But if these are normal internal pages and you otherwise have them on your site without direct links between each other, then that makes it a lot harder for us to crawl. Um, do impressions or traffic affect crawl frequency? Pages with high traffic are crawled more frequently than ones with low traffic. So I think this is more of like correlation causation type situation where we don't really see how many people are actually going through these pages. But if we can tell that this is an important page within a website, we will try to crawl it more frequently. So that specifically happens when we recognize within a website that maybe this is one of the main pages where all the news articles are posted, or this is kind of like the news feed within your website. And that's something where we'll recognize that things are changing quickly there, that it's interesting for users if we have that content. And we will try to crawl that more frequently. So that's essentially us trying to figure out where does it make sense to crawl more frequently uh, compared to which parts of the site kind of stay more stable and don't need to be crawled that frequently. John, would you say that um, links matter on that? Um, links matter with regards to crawling. Yes. Yeah. I, yeah. Yeah. I mean, we, we need to be able to find those pages first. So links matter, at least in, in that regard. Uh, but also, if we can tell that this is an important page within the website, that things kind of come together at this point, then that's something that, that also helps us there. It's not so much that you need to build external links to those pages, but even internally within the site, if we can recognize that it like everything kind of comes together there, then that's a sign for us that this is something that maybe we should crawl more frequently. And I think the other thing to add there is that just because something is being crawled more frequently doesn't mean that it's more important for search. So we do try to separate the crawling from the indexing and ranking part in the sense that maybe something needs to be updated very frequently, but that doesn't mean that it's automatically more relevant for people searching for that topic. It's just from a technical point of view, we try to update it frequently, but that doesn't mean that we're going to rank it very high uh, just because it's changing frequently. All right. All right. Uh, kind of similar to crawling questions, is it possible to have a robots text line disavow, disallow the middle of a query string, not just the beginning? Um, sure, you can do that. You can use the asterisk wildcard character to kind of let us know about uh, that essentially anything up to that point can be ignored, and then there's a specific part that you're looking at there. John, if a site no indexes like two thirds of its content, would that cause any kind of a problem or penalty? No. In an attempt to clean out the the weaker stuff. No. That's fine. Yeah. OK. Thank you. Uh, we've hit our size limit for robots text, so we're looking for alternate ways to preserve our crawl bandwidth by not having thousands of variations indexed for our search results pages. Is it just as useful to add no index, no follow at a page level? Uh, sure. You can use no index, no follow on a page level, and that will help us to not crawl those pages. Uh, the tricky part there is we still have to crawl those pages that have the no index, no follow on it so that we can see that markup. Uh, but I think the, the bigger problem that I see kind of in the background of this question is when you're saying you've hit the size limit for the robots text file, then probably your robots text file is way too complicated and is going to be really tricky to actually maintain in the long run. So 
that's something where I'd spend a bit of time to really significantly reduce the size of the robots.txt file so that it's a lot easier to maintain, so that you easily see which parts of your site are being blocked by robots.txt, which parts aren't, and uh, those kind of things. Also, with regards to URL variations, I try to avoid uh, using URL parameters that are kind of unique or search path elements that are really unique in the sense that sometimes it makes it really hard for us to crawl a site and go through the unique content and not all of the duplicates within the site. So simplifying the URLs in a way that makes it easier for us to focus on the unique URLs is really important. But I really also try to simplify the robots text file in a case like this. John, sorry to jump in again. Um, it's just on that matter, if he adds the no index and no follow, either way, Googlebot would have to index that page in order to see the no index. And it that would eat his crawl budget anyhow, right? That would definitely have an effect. But if from that page, for example, you link to thousands of search variations, then at least we wouldn't follow that to those other pages that are linked there. Yeah, but that if that would be like no index follow, it wouldn't matter that much, no, right? If it's just no index, we would still follow the, those links, exactly. OK. Um, let me see. What can we pick up here? Um, uh, over 18 months ago, we 301 redirected our site from one TLD to another TLD. Um, that was we withdrew the request and removed the redirects three weeks ago. It seems like Google is still processing this as a site move. So in general, you'll probably still see some of those old URLs if you specifically search for them. So if you do a site query, uh, that's probably what you'll still see there with regards to withdrawing the site move request. And I imagine putting content on the old URLs again. That's something that essentially just takes time once the content is there. So that's not something that will immediately work. But uh, as soon as we see that there's unique content there that we can index it separately, then I think those 18 months are probably enough for us to realize that uh, this content has actually moved to the new domain. And another site move question. Let's see. Uh, if we would want to move a section of our large website to a new domain, would it be OK to keep a copy of the section on the original site for old customers, but canonical all the pages to a new domain? Um, sure, you can do that. What will just happen there is we'll crawl both of these versions. Uh, we'll see the canonical. For us, the canonical is kind of a signal. It's not a directive like a 301 redirect would be. So we'll probably pick up most of the pages on the new location, but we might still index some of them with the older, older location. And if that's not specifically a problem for you at the moment, that's fine. It's not something that would be a significant problem for us. Hey, John, can I have a quick uh, follow-up on that? Sure. Uh, so regarding site moves, I sent you a, a couple of weeks ago a boom, Google Plus message with a new Google Plus. I'm not sure if I sent it correctly. It was about a blogger redirect to the to a custom domain not hosted on Blogger that featured a, um, a page asking users about the redirect. So I, I don't know if that was the best way. Uh, in case you didn't get the URL, here it is again. Uh, so. That extra page, I'm not sure if it, uh, for Google, um, if it's uh, redirecting properly the Google bot, or whether okay. we should use some other type of redirect. I don't know. I'd have to double check. I imagine this was right uh, while I was traveling to, to the various conferences. But I, I'll uh, double check. Or if you can ping that link, uh, drop another comment on that thread, then hopefully it will bubble up in my inbox again. And I can take a look at that. I think that was a general question, like how do you move from a blogger site to your own custom domain, essentially, right? Yeah. Yeah. OK, well done. Thanks. Sure. Um, here's one we get sometimes. A couple of directories are building a massive amount of links to a website, and they want some money for each link to be removed. So they're essentially trying to be jerks and uh, charge money for something that they put up. 
uh, type of spam to try to like, I don't know, harm your site. Um, but the question goes on. We disavow all the bad links, and they keep building new links. What can we do? Uh, so from our point of view, I looked into a couple of these cases, and we essentially already ignore most of these directories. Um, what you can do on your side is if you're seeing this happening, I would just disavow the whole domain and move on. That's not something you need to uh, have that removed. You definitely know, don't need to pay anything uh, to have those kind of links removed. Well, there's a lot of criticism out there that it doesn't work, disavowing. It definitely works on our side. So um, from from that point of view, I, I don't really know what what to add there. If essentially the criticism is we don't believe what Google says, then I don't know what I could say to make people believe that uh, it's actually true. But uh, from our point of view, the disavow tool definitely works. It definitely um, handles the submissions that you do there correctly. Um, let's see. Can I just jump in with a quick quickie? Sure. Um, I'll just send you a link. Um, submit. We've had a problem with um, we have photo pages where there may be 10, 20, 50 photos in a gallery um, of a gig or something like that. We've had a problem where we had them all on individual pages originally. And we think that was causing us issues. So we've merged everything into one page. So all the similar photos have merged into one page. We've had a problem with Google Images where we were using a slider. And um, anything that's lazy loading or out of view of the slider was not ranking anymore, which was, you know, we were kind of cutting off our nose to spite our face there. Um, I'll just send you a link to a page uh, with some disclosure photos on it from a gig from the other day. I just wonder if you, you could recommend a better way of handling it. You know, we want the images to individually rank, uh, but we don't want to be penalized for, you know, duplicate content. Um, putting them on separate pages shouldn't be a problem in general. So I, I need to take a look at the, the yeah. URL afterwards. OK. Um, we was uh, using Prevnext as well to show that it is a set. Yeah, so that shouldn't really be a problem if you, if you put them on URL separately. With <coughs> lazy loading, like you mentioned, the, the bigger problem is that uh, we might not actually see the image linked directly because it's not really shown when we sure. uh, pick up the page. Sure. But uh, that's probably something where we could uh, take a look at your example and see if we can maybe do a blog post about this topic in general. I would because very much appreciate especially it. Especially with, with lazy loading, with images, <coughs> image galleries, that's a, a type of question we get every now and then. I know, yeah. I think Mihai has uh, al already battled through a bunch of this with his site, so it's definitely not something that's unique to you. Sure. I, I'll definitely take a look at that and see. Thank what you very much. Do. Appreciate that. Thank you. All right. Uh, one more. Spam type question, uh, are sites tarnished in any way after penalty recovery? And is there any situation when it would be easier to rank by moving to a new domain post penalty? Uh, so from our point of view, at least from a manual action point of view, sites don't have any kind of a bad karma if they used to be flagged for kind of spammy things and now they aren't. Uh, there's one kind of exception there in that when we see that a site keeps going into a manual action, cleans itself up a little bit, goes out and goes back in, and kind of sneakily switches from the, a good site to a spammy site and back again a few times, then it's possible that the manual action team will say, well, we'll just wait and see what the site that ends up as in a half a year or a little bit later down the line. So that's one situation where, where it might have a kind of a longer effect there, but that's really a rarer situation and really the type of situation where we think that this is kind of maliciously being switched back and forth. So it's not something that would accidentally happen. The other thing to mention there is that uh, sometimes our algorithms also look at uh, spammy or, or bad techniques that are used on a site and try to flag that. And in those situations, Sometimes it can happen that our algorithms take a bit longer to process everything, to pick up the problems, but also to recognize that things have been resolved. So you might see some, some effect 
there. Um, that's specifically true around maybe the quality algorithms that we have that take a bit of time to actually pick up the changes, uh, those kind of situations. But if we're just looking at it from a manual action point of view, if you've cleaned it up, if you've gone through the reconsideration request, then you're OK. There's nothing manually holding your site back after that kind of a cleanup. All right. Um, we still have a bunch of questions lined up. Um, but let me just open it up for questions from you guys in, in the meantime, and we'll see. Pick and choose from one or the other lists. Can I ask a question? Sure. Um, we had a we had a link today from the Daily Telegraph. We were in a because of the type of company we are, so it was a gift article for Christmas, which is fairly normal. Uh, so in normal circumstances, an article or a link from the Daily Telegraph would be a a good thing because I assume Google would treat that as an authoritative source. But when you look through the article, it's clear that there are other people in there as well, and there, there's maybe 10 companies in there. They're all no-follow except for one, which which means it's clearly some kind of sponsored article without it mentioning it, unless unless I'm being paranoid. But does that mean that it's harder for you now to spot what is, given that newspapers have to make money somehow, even the, the good ones? How's Google handling that sort of fairly obvious link placement without mentioning sponsorship? It's clearly a sponsored post. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> it's um, probably not something that we would always be able to pick out algorithmically, automatically right away. So I imagine there might be some of these situations that that either slips through or where we recognize that a site is like regularly doing sneaky things. We say, well, we can't really trust the site completely. They have great content, but we don't really trust their links. Uh, those kind of things can happen as well. I mean, so I assume not... they have to make money these days, so it, it must be harder and harder to not sell well, content. Well, I mean, you can, you can make money otherwise, too. You don't have to do that in ways that like negatively affect search engines or that specifically go against the, the guidelines that we put together there. So I from my point of view, it's it's not something where you have to break our guidelines in order to survive as a business. That definitely right. shouldn't be the case. But there, there should be in that case there should be no real penalty for the person that has got the follow link versus the ten others that don't. They should still get the same benefit even though it's clearly a sponsored yeah, post. I, I don't know how in that specific case it would be handled. I, I do know that the, the web spam team does look for patterns like that. And they do regularly do the, these kind of roundups where they go through sites that, that look like they're doing these type of games or sites that are primarily getting their links like that. And they do take action on that. And that's not something that you directly see in the search results, because if the web spam team goes through and says, oh, this site is doing something sneaky, we're just going to ignore all of the outbound links on there, then that's not something you like see as a flag in the search results. You wouldn't, as Santiago just said, you wouldn't see that as buying links, because that is buying links. That would be sure. I mean, we would see that as buying links or selling links. Yeah. OK. I, I sent an email. I'm seeing some stuff that's happening here. A lot of uh, in uh, different areas, a lot of spammy sites are reaching to the top. I mean, is that just uh, one of the situation where we have to wait until the other character comes in? The other character. The other character starting with a P. Yeah. I'm just tired I'm of even saying that name. Pirate. Wait. No, he's right here. <laughs> You see, he's right here. I'm waiting. Okay. But no, uh, no. On a serious note, I'm just seeing a lot of. I sent you an email regarding yeah. that, um, and I'm seeing a lot of the sister sites back. So it's like, hey, okay, you know, I can create also, you know. But if you don't mind going into that one, because it's so strange to see now that, you know, I yeah. sent you. An email, I, so I, I mean, that that's the kind of stuff that we we do pass on to the search quality team, also to the web spam team to review. It's not the case that we can take all of these reports and say, well, we're going to take manual action on this specific set of sites. 
but especially if we see a bigger pattern of things that we've missed either algorithmically or manually, then we will try to do what it takes to improve our search results. So did you pass my email, the one I sent you? Of course. OK. It's just it's, uh, I guess, it feels like a restore somehow. Yeah, I, I know it's frustrating. If you're working on a site and you see someone else kind of jump ahead by doing all of these uh, spammy techniques, it's it's always frustrating. And uh, it's, it's something we do take seriously. It's something we, we do pass on to the team and discuss with them. But we can't like promise to do anything specific for a lot of these reports, because sometimes it makes more sense to say, well, this is another one that goes into this bucket, and when it, this bucket is big enough, then we'll like maybe create a new algorithm based on the feedback that we have there. Or maybe we'll say, well, this is a big enough bucket that we need to handle it manually. Um, in the meantime, until we do have a better algorithm to pick well, these one bucket, There's one bucket that has about uh, 27 of them. And I think I sent you that yeah. one. There. 27 is, is still a small number for like the general web. but. Uh, yeah, I, I continue sending them. Um, I, again, I can't promise that we actually do take action on these all individually, because otherwise the team would be busy just like hitting one site after another and wouldn't have time to actually um, find ways to, to do it in a more scalable way so that we can improve all of the search results rather than just this one specific query. OK. A real quick one, last one from me, if you don't mind. Sure. Uh, we polled users and found that uh, we had a very small navigation, um, so we've expanded it quite a lot by adding all the sort of best and new content to it. It seems to have impacted the search negatively. Um, would, could you pass comment on that? Do you know what the navigation is? Does Google know what the navigation is? Yeah, I mean, usually we were pretty good at figuring out which part of the content is, is like the main content and which part is more like the boilerplate, so stuff that's repeated across the website. Um, if you change something significantly within your templates, then obviously it's going to take a while for everything to settle down again. But uh, once it's settled down, then we should be able to pick that up properly and use that properly. Um, I guess what, one thing that sometimes happens is if the navigation is significantly increased, then we have a lot more text on these pages, which makes it a little bit harder to pick out which part is actually the it relevant seems part. To, it seems to have thinned the relevance. That's that's the effect that we be, that I believe I'm seeing. Could that be the yeah. case? Potentially, I don't know. <laughs> it's it's hard to say, but uh, these are the type of things that usually settle down after a while. So if you've recently yeah. made that change, yeah. then maybe give Think it a couple it. of months to to settle down. Uh, if it's been a year now, then probably it's something else. OK. Thank you, John. Thank you, John. I have two quick questions, if sure. I may. One is a yes or no. Is Penguin still on track to be launched by the end of this year? As far as I know, yes. All right, so he's right in the bag. He's right here in my bag. And the second question is the location filter in the search tools. Um, did it go away? Is it a bug? Do you know anything about that? I don't know. I saw a bunch of reports about that on, on Google Plus, but uh, I don't know what's what's behind that. So a lot of these search features come and go, and they have ex we have experiments to kind of turn them on, try them in different ways. So I imagine it's something around there where maybe we did some experiments and we decided well it's not that important anymore or what would pick up the location better manu automatically now. I, I don't know the background there. So basically, the bus driver is gone. He's lost. Because uh, it just says Canada. It says, on, like, in where I am, it just says Canada. It doesn't give you an option to, like, see. Maybe we can pick it out better automatically now. I, I don't know how, how that works there. I, at least, like, in, in Switzerland, I don't think we've ever had the location um, box there. I can show you if you want. I haven't just seen it in a really long time. So it, the, these are things that, from from my point of view, in the search UI, they they just change from time to time. It's uh, these are changes that that we make for a variety of reasons. It's not to kind of decrease the quality of the search results, but maybe to make it easier, to make it more 
um, kind of fit together with, with the other types of search results that we have uh, for the different devices, those kind of things. It's definitely not something where we're saying, oh, let, what can we do today to mess with webmasters? Because we don't have that kind of time either, and uh, we, we like working with you guys. No, we just uh, the reason the thing is it was so precise. Like uh, as soon as that feature came, it was like precise. Okay, I'm in Toronto. I want to, you know, this is the precise result. So I guess we have to, if it stays like this, we get accustomed to this new thing. It's hard. Yeah, um, some of these you can still kind of trigger by just modifying the URL. So I don't know if that's with uh, the location. I believe there's like a URL parameter. That, that needs to be pulled out with the location. Maybe you can try that. Um, if you see that the search results are really lower quality because of this, this kind of change where you say, well, I'm searching for Burger King, and it's showing me Burger King in Vancouver, and I'm in Toronto, then that's the type of thing we would say is a bug that we really need to fix. But if we're able to pick out the location automatically, and you're in Toronto, and it shows you results from Toronto, then from my point of view, that's fine. The, the less work the searcher has to do to get usable results, the, the more likely they, they will get usable results by default. Hey, John, can I jump on with my last question about numerous pages on the website? Sure. Uh, so what if a website has a lot of pages with similar products on them and content? Uh, can it cause applying some Google filters or influence on the ranking of the entire website? So a lot of similar products to other websites or within the same website? So for example, it's a website about car parts, uh, and it's separated about uh, on year make models. So basically, pages may be very, very similar, but some of the products may actually be different. For example, one product will be available on the page for 85 Pontiac, but it will be missing only one year for 86 Pontiac. So basically, all con content is kind of the same, but it's really like important for users to see the current year, current model, uh, and current make. Yeah, that, that sounds fine. That's, that wouldn't be something I'd kind of artificially suppress. OK. But what um, if maybe it makes sense to just like make one page with listing all the models that you support. That's one variation that we sometimes see, like the like have all variations on separate URL or have one URL that has a list of the different variations on it. Okay. Oh well it's kinda doesn't fit because there there may be some exceptions which will cause the user like to be um, what if there's about one million of pages of this kind? So does I that see problem. No I see problem. I mean we have to crawl and index these pages, but if we can do that it's, it should be a problem. I, I think some of that probably can be optimized by grouping it more into um, higher level pages, but uh, in general, that should be possible. Like that. Would that be possible if I could send you a uh, like couple of examples of that website? Because it's kind of a big automotive sure. website. So sure. you can just take a look more clearly. All right. John, are you uh, promoting uh, Sweden's area code? No. Because I see the 46 uh, trying I, to figure I, out. Yeah. I have to go now. Um, we have people waiting for this room. So it's, it's been great talking to you all. Um, hopefully, I'll see you again in one of the future Hangouts. Bye, everyone. Bye.